Thanks so much. Thank you, John. And thanks for everybody who's listening in. Um, I, I look after Michael's impressive talk. I, I feel like a simple surgeon who's come down from the hill. But uh, um, I always get very nervous when John North, the head of Quasim, rings you up when you're a regional head of a surgical department. And, and then when he uh, gets on the phone and says, uh, would you like to speak about uh, clinical decision making? You think, oh, crikey, is he thinking it's really bad? What you do there? <laughs> um, but uh, what I thought I would do was just, uh, um, just simply give my personal um, impressions about what's happened in the 25 years uh, that I spent uh, working as a surgeon in Toowoomba. So those surfers amongst you will know this is the behemoth, uh, that uh, giant wave that occurs off Portugal. But uh, a lot of situations in life where you have to weigh, weigh up the risk versus uh, benefit ratio. And um, as, the, as the clash say, uh, should I stay or should I go? Um, <laughs> basically, um, with the, the surfer up the top there and the onlookers, uh, I, I don't know what the right decision is. <laughs> So the synopsis of my presentation is today is to look at what I've seen as the changes to clinical decision-making to over that 25-year period, try and relate it to my uh, specific interest uh, um, management, uh, which is uh, breast cancer, have a few historical interludes, and then uh, look at the futuristic uh, clinical decision-making. Uh, Steve Berry, the American author, uh, has a quote that everyday decision making around the world is constantly based on what came before us. And I think that quite aptly applies to medical decision making as well. Now, there's a bit of photoshopping going on here. I don't know if the, you surgeons know that famous 1905 canvas uh, from the Baltimore, um, the John Hopkins Medical School. But uh, uh, when I think about who's influenced me in regards to my uh, clinical decision making, well, I've got uh, Professor Stitz, Professor O'Loughlin, Professor Pegg, and Professor North. But uh, uh, I think if we all look back and, and think what has formulated how we actually make our decisions, uh, we've either been taught by these people or mentored by them or had them as colleagues. So I got the opportunity to go and ask my Rob friends to go and help him up in Toowoomba in 1995. And Rob, Rob looks a lot better than that now. Um, <laughs> but but uh, back in those days, things weren't particularly complicated. I mean, you really just need to have a lot of intuition. A confused uh, cerebral cortex. We had good training from the RACS. Uh, you had gained experience. We had great surgeon, surgeon mentors. Uh, we were able to get onto a device called the telephone and, and ring up and ask our friends and speak to colleagues. And back in those days, you had to learn to deal with the slow return of pathology and radiology. But I think we did pretty well. It's not working. It's not working either. Oh, I went. got nothing to do with your leadership, what I'm about to say, Robert. Um, so this isn't a poor surgical outcome that came out of Toowoomba, just for the record. Um, it, is, it is an illustration, though, of this uh, quote that I really, really enjoy. Good surgical judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from poor surgical judgment. And if you think about it, that's exactly right. So the use of photography as a medical tool started at the end of the American Civil War. And at that stage, the orthopods will know more about this than I, that, but it was presumed that if you took out all the shattered bone, that it would give the residual bone a chance to uh, heal and elongate, but obviously that didn't work out. So essentially, um, our management of uh, patients or decision-making in those days was based on uncertainty. We didn't know what we were dealing with. We had a lot of hypotheses which we came up with, which uh, helped us come up with our differential diagnosis. And then we relied on probability to decide what was the most likely uh, way to treat this patient and what was the likely outcome. So if you go through the literature, I'll probably, you know, it, it would uh, fall under the guidelines that we had this proactive approach. So obviously it's an acronym which uh, stands for, those, uh, uh, for all those trade-offs there. But uh, um, it, uh, it, it, as I said, it was a very effective, it worked well for us. 
But that uncertainty is, I suppose, can be compared to the, the parent returning home to the open door and the uncertainty of what's actually on the other side. And uh, will I or won't I, and will I proceed? And then copying what has to, you know, what's going to be there. But at all times, I would uh, declare that uh, all our decisions uh, under all circumstances were done in the best interest of the patient, uh, aimed at best practice to try and, and, and provide a best patient outcome provide quality care, be a patient advocate, and, and at the same time, always evaluating our progress uh, to either try and correct uh, and improve the situation. But as the American Navy decided in 1960s to try and get the most effective system control, they came up with the acronym, keep it simple, stupid. And I think that's you know, certainly uh, what we tried to do in those early days. So jump 25 years, and we haven't become as good as uh, Bones, McCoy and Enterprise yet with our diagnostic tools, uh, which help us to diagnose and, and, uh, and manage. But we've also got the, uh, the uh, MDT, which I call the uh, Fantastic Four. Um, basically, you know, the oncologist, the radiologist, the surgeon and the uh, pathologist, and I'll leave you to decide who's who. But, uh, I, I think there's no doubt it's been shown many times today that the, the use of the MDT has been a very effective tool in coming in with us coming forward with our best clinical decision making. So in 2020, there's been a heap of stuff that's happened, um, uh, which has made our decisions of uh, clinical decision making a lot easier. Um, we've got a big growth in the department. We've got a lot of extra specialization We've got a lot of uh, multidisciplinary teams in different areas. We've got a uh, markedly improved radiology and pathology service, and we've got, uh, we've got the, a greater employment of the artificial intelligence. I mean, there's a lot of apps out there which we can use to help diagnose uh, appendicitis, help us decide about what we do uh, with our uh, uh, oncology management. So I, I think particularly artificial intelligence is starting to play a bigger role. Why am I showing a picture of Admiral Nelson at the Battle of Trafalgar? Well, first of all, he was uh, utilising fully an MDT to uh, come up with his best battle plan. So that's one thing. The second thing is uh, he, uh, um, despite under adverse physical uh, situations, so he only had one eye and one arm, remember, uh, he was one, he became one of the famous um, uh, naval commanders of all times. And thirdly, what he should have done was he didn't listen to the uh, advice of his MDT, where particularly his surgeon told him, don't make yourself conspicuous, which he didn't listen to, obviously, and uh, subsequently copped a sniper's bullet and died. So just a few valuable lessons to take on there. So I mean, look, I, I can vouch that we haven't actually, over the years, we haven't done any formal investigation upon how successful our clinical decision making has been. But if you look at objective and subjective factors, which uh, perhaps suggest we've, we have actually improved, um, we have instituted change where we found that that's brought about uh, a better patient outcome, uh, improved our patient outcomes, such as uh, patient satisfaction, reduced morbidity, improved survival. Um, and I suppose one of the other things I, I think, you know, if you, if you look back and I couldn't get uh, any information about this was the reduction in clinical incidents occurring at the hospital. Uh, John and his team kindly uh, helped me uh, uh, get some data from Quasim. I couldn't specifically, thankfully, relate it to Toowoomba, um, but it, it's across the state. And, and obviously some of this data I've hidden because I didn't think it was very uh, uh, complimentary to my case. But uh, essentially, you know, as you would expect, the, uh, the number of uh, um, uh, general surgery um, recordings uh, over the years has increased uh, to Quasim. Um, but if you look at the proportion of uh, uh, cases where... Um, uh, as, as you can see by the number there, the, in general surgery makes up uh, most of those cases. But uh, if you look at uh, the percentage where there has been, a, um, over the last 12 years, where there's been a, uh, looking at the delays in surgical diagnosis, there's been a general trend downwards, um, and the delays uh, to surgery have been a general, general trend downwards. So if you try and correlate with that with more effective uh, 
clinical decision making, well, that would seem to add up. Um, with regards to patients treated in ICU, well, this, uh, I mean, there wasn't any uh, outstanding information there. It's been pretty, um, pretty um, steady over the years. So uh, I would have expected that perhaps if we were better at clinical decision making, there might have been a, a significant downward trend, but there wasn't that to be seen by the data. Um, and, and likewise, um, uh, we've already, strangely enough, when the surgeons were asked about whether they thought there'd been a, uh, uh, a significant delay in surgery, uh, I mean, they might have been trying to cover things up, I suppose, but there wasn't, uh, there seemed to be a marked difference between that and what actually happened. Um, with regards to communication issues, there was actually a general trend of uh, suggesting improved communication and again correlating perhaps with uh, better clinical decision making. So I, I like this quote because I think it sort of, it, it aptly reminds us that um, in, in making decisions, um, you know, we've always got to uh, take into account the, the situations that are around us. And, um, and uh, uh, just, you know, I, I think you have to realise that uh, uh, perhaps uh, that um, under adverse conditions, we're probably not going, always going to make the best decisions that we could have. And I had a bit of a think about too, over the years, what things may have led to poor decision making. And I suppose number one at the head of the list is inexperience. But uh, I think uh, personal situations can obviously uh, influence as well, such as grief, um, illness and, uh, and uh, depression. And a whole host of these sort of things can uh, decrease that. Now, with regards to uh, my specific field of breast cancer, I thought I'd just quickly go through this. So in 1997, when I first started up, we didn't have the, the breast surgery ends. Um, and so all the general surgeons in town were doing breast cancer surgery. We, uh, at that time, as Robert knows, uh, basically we were relying heavily on doing frozen section uh, uh, pathology. Uh, so a lot of the time the patients didn't know whether they're actually going to have half a breast or a whole breast removed at the time of the surgery. Um, and the incidence of uh, conservation breast surgery to mastectomy at that time, at that stage was uh, 30 to 70. Um, if I extract the Queensland cancer online data, basically that uh, similarly showed, and we were pretty consistent in the state, showing that our our uh, conservation rate uh, was in the order of 40% and our uh, mastectomy state um, rate was in the form of 60. So come 2020, uh, we've now got four surgeons who are specifically uh, linked with breast cancer surgery and longer, uh, full members of breast surgeons. We have a regular MDT, which is held every two weeks. We've got seven medical oncologists uh, around the place. We've got the full uh, range of uh, breast cancer radiology. Um, we, uh, we've got breast cancer nurses, we've got uh, central node technology, hologic uh, specimen imaging. So uh, all, these, uh, all these various aspects are contributing to uh, what I, I believe is better um, clinical decision making. So that's our happy MDT working at St Andrews every two weeks. And uh, if you, I know there's a busy slide too, but if you look at the data from there, it shows that we've actually reversed the, the numbers uh, for mastectomy and, uh, and breast conservation surgery that uh, mastectomy is in the order now of uh, about 30% and uh, conservation surgery in the order of about 70%. Just, uh, um, actually, um, the, uh, one of the slides I was going to show has dropped out there, unfortunately. But anyway, um, with regards to the future, um, obviously I, I see that there's going to be a greater role for artificial intelligence. Um, I mean, the only, uh, the only issue I see with that is that you've got to have, be able to have a manual override because at some stage machines are going to break down and aren't always going to be able to do what we want them to do. Um, but uh, certainly it's the AI uh, influence is, is, is there to stay. Um, and just finally, uh, surgeons as pilots uh, need to remain focused on the job ahead. And uh, despite, uh, despite, despite uh, distractions, we've always got to uh, remember uh, that we are, the most important thing we're doing is trying to care for our patients or, or uh, crew members. 
So if you can't see it, the airplane comes straight forward with me. So, um, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. I think Rob has a comment to start with. Yeah, I'll take about his appearance. <laughs> Thanks. I look a lot better now. Hopefully, um, in two, uh, two comments really. The, the mastectomy rate actually probably is due more to the availability of radiotherapy. As you know, the range almost seemed like the late, uh, females or patients wouldn't go to Brisbane uh, for radiotherapy. The remaining breast and often chose mastectomy, knowing full well they could have conservation quite easily due to the size of their tumour. Um, and the second, uh, so I think the great advance is having that service in, in town. Uh, and the other comment was uh, the use of ICU, I don't think it's a bad thing. And I think we, you know, surgeons, doesn't matter what craft group you use, we push the envelope with our frail patients we talked to uh, earlier today. And uh, access to ICU is just critical for those because that'll make a big difference whether someone will do good in the 24 hours post, you know, a lot of surgical work to, to a recovery because the last thing you want to do is be sick in a busy ward at night where there's only a few nurses on the floor. I suppose it, it reflects two factors. I agree with you entirely there about the ICU, but the thing is, I suppose if, it's, if there's been misdiagnosis and they're obviously sick by the time they actually get to realise that uh, ICU is going to be used uh, potentially um, a lot more than it would have been if they you know, weren't, uh, weren't sick. Um, but I, as, you, as you say, I mean, it's using, getting utilised for a lot more of the big cases now and with, uh, with the best for the patient. Um, and certainly the, uh, with regards to the mastectomy conservation rate, I mean, there is a strong correlation between the locality of the radiotherapy unit. Uh, and that correlates well with it's been there over 10 years now, so. Sorry. Chris Allen. Oh, just one thing. The the bit on the data, Eric, there with the time to diagnosis, I, I was sort of thinking about that when you put that up uh, and how it was coming down. I, I kind of wondered if the biggest change that I had seen in terms of improvement in diagnostic ability and time to was just access to modern imaging, in particular CT scans. You know, you think about the patient presenting with abdominal pain nowadays for emergency, they almost almost all get CT scans in yeah. emergency, doesn't matter what it is, or almost. I mean, I'm, I'm over-exaggerating a little, um, but it, it's compared, just go back five years and 10 years, I mean, and, and they've looked at them for a bit, 20 years, uh, with access to CT. So I do wonder if that's had something to do with, the, with that improvement. I, I, I think certainly the um, time has gone where, uh, uh, if I, if I think back when we were run from the emergency department, they say, look, we've got somebody of RIF pain, we're not sure what it is. And now, uh, more often than not, you get rung and say, we've got a patient with appendicitis because as you, Chris, you, as you said, they've already had the CT or ultrasound or they've gone and had their Avogadro, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, app score done and, you know, it's all consistent with appendicitis. So it's sort of taken a bit of that diagnostic. But I suppose that the thing is, that you, I think we've all been caught out where everyone's been around focus on that one particular thing. Everybody thought it was appendicitis and didn't think outside the box. And it turned out to be something, you know, you get in there and find out something else. Um, so I, I think we've just got to be cautious about sort of being too focused about things. And, but just be aware, as I say, that, you know, with all this AI assistance that we're getting now from apps and all that, you know, improved imaging and everything else that uh, um, we just got to keep using our brain at times. Has anybody in the room used or become interested in artificial intelligence or shouldn't I ask that question at this point? Well, I'd say Dr. Rudd has, or Professor Rudd, I'm yeah, sorry. Professor <laughs> Rudd obviously has. <laughs> I don't actually have a university title. That's the first thing I'll say. Um, yeah. Um, so artificial intelligence is gonna provide us with a few really important things. Um, the last hundred years, we've been, when we analyse data, we've been looking at it from the point of view of correlation. So we can look at one group of data and another, and we can't demonstrate or prove that X causes Y, unless we do a randomised controlled trial. Now, um, as a child at the age of three, 
we are able to, with our intelligence, our natural intelligence, discriminate between correlation and cause and effect. And um, for the last 20 years, people have been using um, algorithms and Bayesian networks, and um, they're getting close to developing the kind of artificial intelligence that will, um, that will be able to determine from stuff like the data that I was showing you, retrospective data, that sort of bog standard stuff that we keep in databases, they'll be able to use artificial intelligence to determine what caused what. And that, that, will, that will have a profound effect on the way we practice medicine. Yeah, thank you. At, at Quasim, we've started to think a little bit about AI. I, I say think about because it's not that simple, is it? And it's much more complex than I and, uh, and all the team there. But, you know, there will be answers if we really are able to get all the baseline data as well as all the death data and uh, perhaps improve our surgical case form so we get better data. And I can see in 10 years AI will be a much more significant part of our prediction process, our prediction phase in these sort of things. And so we won't have to go to Nick and say, look, forget that people don't die of total uh, knee replacement, total hip replacement crises, or oh, I have the knee is, everybody gets it, doesn't, don't they? Um, sorry. Um, we will be able to go and say, hey, listen, um, this is what the data says, this is what the data looks like, and uh, you try to refute it if you can. And it may even make him redundant. Is that too long a term view? We'll have to talk to him tomorrow. Is that all right? Well, if there's no I, more... I, I mean, I think Chris will back me up here too, that I mean, there certainly moves afoot to try and really um, reduce the influence of breast surgeons in breast cancer management um, uh, with the... Uh, uh, the greater use of neoadjuvant therapy, and which has been very effective, and um, but uh, you, you know certainly the online tools are being you know the oncologists are employing them very uh, very readily to, to help make their management decisions, and they get obviously mentioned at the MDTs big time as well. So I was, I was at a, oddly enough an electronic medical record conference a year or so ago, and one one. Uh, I'm like, just made a, he, he said, oh yeah, the ones that I, that I won't, the people that I uh, am concerned for in future in terms of artificial intelligence is radiologists and pathologists, because it's about image analysis. And he said, that's what's coming. He said, I, I think that the clinicians that's are going to be point, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, we're probably all right. Very good. Look, we're very close to time. And thank you very much. I think we might call it a day there. Thank you, Eric, for your Thanks, uh, presentation and uh, full view. Sorry about the last slide there. But